Chapter 14 The Wizard Jim winced at the sound of screams echoing up through the cold metal halls. Nix mightn't be able to speak, but her cries of anguish and pain were as harrowing as any he'd ever heard. He suspected sounds such as this must come from a place deeper than language, deeper even than hearing, a primal part of you that just needed to summon help. Help. He remembered the name sign she'd given him, Boy Who Helps, but trapped up here in this dark cell he could do nothing but listen impotently and imagine what the old man was doing to her. She'd been taken an hour ago, dragged away by one of the unthinking grey men, while the others had been thrown into two matching cells that faced each other across a dank corridor. Jim and Scup had a high, narrow window for light through which they could see the tops of the trees below, while Duke and Gam had to make do with the dim glow of an ancient tech light that flickered and pulsed in a bracket on the ceiling. The cells were up high. They'd realised that even before helping each other up to the window. From the moment they'd been dragged past the false cliffs, Jim had been trying to piece together this strange metal fortress. The entire hill on the west coast of the island was fake, dressed with stone and dirt and even plants on the outside, but built of steel and clad with a dense mesh of shielding within. Here, at the uppermost level, were the cells in what must have been the crest of the hill. Below them, wide chambers were filled with the silhouettes of strange machines that defied his imagination. Below that was the cavernous hall that hid behind the false cliffs, where the grey men had dragged them over a wide, curving bridge. A channel of calm seawater wound its way to the far end of this lower cavern, where it met reflected daylight. A small, single-sailed catboat was moored alongside the false metal shore, protected from the tides without. Even in his groggy state, Jim had remembered the cat boat, and realisation had dawned upon him. Node. The old techromancer they'd been searching for this whole time. In a wee cat boat he was too, hardly big enough for open water. That's what the fishers had said in Vitsamar. Jim remembered the storm and marvelled at the idea that an old man, alone, had made it a hundred clicks across open sea in that tiny vessel. He wondered, at first, if perhaps Node too was a prisoner of the Grey Men. Perhaps he'd sought shelter here and been thrown in the cells himself, but something about that didn't add up. Node was a techromancer, a great old mage of the ancient ways. Jim didn't think someone like that could be taken easily. And besides, the walls here had shielding, and the corridors buzzed with curious and ancient texts. And then there had been the voice commanding the grey men. A human voice. Old. No, the man was not a captive. He was Node, and this was his island, and they were his prisoners. And he was torturing Nix. What do we do, Jim? We've got to do something. Gam asked, hands clamped over his bandaged ears, trying to shut out Nix's screams, which had reduced now to pained whimpering. The captain will come for us. I know it, Jim said, conjuring as much confidence into his voice as he could muster. Bink will have made it to the Archon, and they'll be searching for us now. Unless they caught him, too, muttered Duke sadly. He'd be here too then, wouldn't he? Jim reassured him. They didn't try special hard to hurt us, remember? They wanted to take us. No reason they'd have treated your brother any different. And they're slow, too. They surprised us, but Bink was running. He could outrun them easy. Duke seemed to find little comfort in the idea of his twin being pursued across this strange island by an army of golems, and tried once more to squeeze himself between the bars of the cell. Whatever this place had been... The cells, like the shielding, were obviously a later addition, and while the steel bars were narrow, they'd been cunningly welded to both floor and ceiling, leaving little hope of escape. Jim, being suitably experienced, had inspected the steel and the weld joints for any hint of flaw or weakness, but had found none. 
They'd tried the window too, of course, but it was little more than a cleft in the false rock at the top of the hills, wide enough to peer out and to let some daylight creep in, but far too narrow for Jim or Scup. Duke might make it, but he was in the wrong cell. Jim wondered if that had been deliberate, if their mute captors had the power of reason, or if it was just plain old bad luck, such as had hounded them since Vitzamar. As it was, Jim had bade his friends remove their shirts, pass them across the narrow corridor, and had knotted them into a crude rope. It was too short, of course, to be of any real use, but they dangled it from the window nonetheless, hoping a search party of Arconauts might see it dangling from the high cliffs and come to investigate. Jim felt the weight of the Tixerix, still in the small sack that was bound at his waist, and wished he'd pushed Waylon harder. If he were here with them, he might be able to use it somehow to summon help, though it wouldn't work without power, of course. Jim was once again clinging to the lip of the high window, struggling for a glimpse of the outside, when Scup tugged at his leg. Dropping to the floor, he turned to see shambling movement climbing the stair from below. There was the unmistakable red glow in the left eye of a grey man golem, and in front, a shuffling, pale figure. Nix! Duke cried. What did they- But his words were cut short by a cry of pain and a white hand that was thrown up to silence him. As Nix shuffled into the dim light, Jim saw her eyes wild with fear and torment. The matted, dirty hair on the left side of her head had been shaved, the skin beneath swollen and bloody. Above and behind her ear, stapled into an open wound, was... something. As she shuffled nearer, Jim couldn't help but gasp. It was Tech. Even his gasp drew a wince of pain. She could hear. This mad mage had made it so she could hear, and every sound looked like agony. Mutely, the prisoners looked on as the golem threw a lever, unlocking the far cell, and shoved Nix inside. Gam and Duke helped her gently to the floor, but Jim caught her eye and signed through the bars. You can hear us. She swallowed and nodded, signing, Hear! Noise! Do not understand! Of course. Jim realised he'd never asked if she'd always been deaf, but clearly she'd never heard words before, only read them on lips. She was getting raw sound and no meaning. Even her own cries and sobs of pain seemed agonising to her. The door of his own cell swung open with a bang, causing Nix to sob again. The golem hesitated, looking between Scarp and Jim as if appraising them with the dull red glow somewhere behind his eye, before snatching Jim by the arm and dragging him bodily from the cell. He heard the old mage's muttering before he was even halfway down the stair, the old voice hoarse and crooked. As the staircase curved down toward the lower level, Jim saw warm light spilling from the space below, glistening off copper walls that were dense with intricate designs. He glimpsed monsters, open seas, great cities falling beneath the waves. As they rounded the final curve, his attention was torn from the murals and toward the space laid out before him. Jim's eyes struggled to take it all in. It was as if someone had combined Wayland's workshop and Syrinx's laboratory, then left them in the dark to breed for a century. The result was wrong, somehow. There were pinching hands that flexed on sinewy metal arms, lenses that seemed to cock their heads in curiosity as he entered, and blinking lights that peered out of the gloom. Everywhere, thick wires snaked like eels across the floor or were gathered in great hangings from the ceiling. The abundant tech here seemed almost alive, and Jim had the strange feeling that each piece was moving and communicating of its own accord. And there, at the heart of it all, was their captor. The old man stooped over a low, bloody metal table that rested atop a single leg at its centre. 
His hunched head was crowned in a mane of wiry grey hair that seemed to magnify the mad twitching and muttering, and his beardless face was deeply lined with a scowl. Jim saw he wore heavy robes that had once been blue but were now threadbare and bleached by decades of use. They reminded him of Wayland's robes, though the young techsmiths now seemed like a poor imitation by comparison. One of his bony arthritic hands reached up to a metal limb, detaching a bloody tool at the tip. Anger and fear swelled in Jim's breast as he saw the instrument that had so hurt his friend. What did you do to her? He yelled, his voice echoing off the copper walls, causing listener dishes to twitch excitedly. The old man didn't even look up. She was broken. I fixed her. As he turned away from the table, Jim choked on a gasp. The handless metal arm moved with him. It was his arm. Dropping the bloody tool to a workbench, Node snatched up a crude imitation of a human hand, offering it up to the wrist of his artificial limb. Wire tendons reached out and linked into the hand, and with a twist and a snap, it was attached. Jim looked on with horror as the metal hand flexed, then curled into a fist in an uncanny mimicry of flesh. She didn't tell me much, of course, but there is data to be had beyond words. Your concern, for example, tells me she's not your prisoner. A friend, then. So you've come from the albinos. To get there, you must have sailed or rowed, which explains also why I didn't hear you coming. The old man turned then, facing him for the first time, and pointed a metal finger right at him. Jim had the strangest sensation that lightning was about to burst from the finger and strike him dead, but all that came were words. Attach the prisoner to the table. The golem at Jim's back that had paused upon entering the room now surged forward once more. Jim was shoved toward the bloody worktop, which, in response tilted upon its pedestal until it was almost vertical. Fearing a similar fate to Nick's, Jim struggled against his captor, but found the grip was like iron, and within moments he found himself pressed against the table. The steel was ice cold against his bare skin, and he felt the wetness of Nick's blood on his back. Restraints snaked from the corners of the surface to grasp his ankles and wrists, though by some small mercy, The device remained upright for now. Now, take twenty men. Search the shore for a sail ship. Without so much as a flicker of human recognition, the grey golem turned and marched toward the downward stair, leaving Jim alone with its master. Jim stared at the old man's back. He wanted to shout, to demand to know his fate, but he kept the words locked away lest the old mage learn anything more from him. All he'd done was to ask about Nix, and somehow this old man had deduced that they were in a sail ship and sent twenty of these things to find it. Jim tried to picture the fight. Two Arconauts to every grey man, and remembered the effortless blow that had sent Scup sprawling into the undergrowth. Jim saw the old mage push a button. There was a whirring, and suddenly a small plastic square was disgorged from a narrow slot on the bench. It looked like a shiny disc was contained within the plastic, but the wizard just scribbled something upon it and tossed it aside, plucking up a new square and sliding it into the slot. He turned then, peering at Jim's body as if he were some new scrap of tech, studying every aspect of him, the tone of his muscles, the show of his ribs even the cloth of his ragged trousers. He muttered to himself all the while. Skinny, brown, eastern blood some way back. Fed well enough. Burns, though. Lots of burns. A worker, then. Yes. Mm, Worker of metal, I think. Slowly he reached Jim's face, his own hovering barely three inches from it as his eyes darted between details, gathering data. He forced Jim's good eye wide with the thumb of his real flesh hand, studying. 
Jim saw that his own eyes were green, flecked through with stripes of yellow-brown that made it look like a fire burned from within. He wasn't as old as Jim had first guessed, older than Rinx, or Sar, of course, but not as ancient as old, mad Loken. He pulled the purple sash roughly from Jim's eye down to his throat and groaned with intrigue as he saw the shrunken blue eye beneath. Mm, blue eye, blue eye, he muttered, clacking his teeth. The ice cat roams atop the hill in search of blue-eyed young to kill. His breath was sharp with the smell of solvents, and it stung Jim's eyes. Node fixed him with a stare. You scanned, boy. Uh, I'm from Rosine. Jim stammered, finding his mouth dry with fear at what the old man might learn from his words. It's just a bad eye, that's all. Hmm. <sighs> The old face frowned suspiciously. Then the man reached up and prodded the barely healed cut below Jim's eye, digging a fingernail into the scab. Jim cried out and writhed against his bonds uselessly, but the old man just raised his finger to his lips and licked at the bloody nail. A diffuse red glow shone somewhere behind his left eye, the same as his grey servant's, and he seemed to pause for a moment, distracted. Then his eyes snapped back to Jim. Very well. Who sent you then? Was it the godsman? The albinos? Sent us? Jim asked, shaking his head. Nobody sent us. We were just seeking shelter from the storm, and you- How did you know about the star? Jim paused, his mind struggling to catch up. So it is a star? The old man barked a harsh laugh then. You could fit a million worlds inside a real star, boy. That is a satellite. But how did you know it would be here? We didn't. We were caught in the storm. You just happened to be headed for the Steel Sea. A hundred clicks from land, a hundred clicks from anywhere. Truth, boy, he demanded, clamping his metal hand over Jim's throat. Jim was surprised to find that the metal was hot to the touch. He felt servos grinding beneath the surface, and the intricate joints pinched at his skin. We saw the star, the satellite, falling, and followed it. It was just luck that it led us to land. Just luck, was it? The old man raised a thick eyebrow. A hundred clicks of open sea, and just luck that it fell on my spit of land. Jim tried to unravel the meaning from his words. He just needed to survive long enough for the captain to find them. He needed to keep him talking. There was pride there. A boast. Are you... Do you mean you made it crash here, then? The power to talk to satellites is beyond anyone now, boy. Even me. Even the raptions. No, but you're nearly there. If the mountain won't come to Mohammed, he must strap on his boots now, mustn't he? But you, you followed it too. Why? He demanded, remembering his line of questioning and constricting his metal hand. We travelled from Vitsima, Jim gasped trying to keep his voice steady. We are following rumours of an old man of the West, a wizard named Node. Jim studied the old face as he spoke, looking for any hint of recognition. That's you, isn't it? The metal hand released, and the old man whirled away. So the fairies did send you. Jim pressed on. It was them as told us about you, yes, but we only came for your wisdom. He searched for the right words, remembering stories like this from his childhood. Oh, great and powerful node, wise among wise. The old wizard barked his cruel, half-coughing laugh again and fidgeted with tools on his worktop, muttering, <laughs> Flattery, is it? I'm not a dragon, boy. If I were, I'd have already taken a limb for your lies. 
He thumped his metal fist into the worktop, causing nearby tech to twitch and jerk away, frightened. We aren't here for the star, I swear it, Jim said earnestly, then decided to risk the whole truth. We're seeking the island of Thule. Node turned then, amusement and surprise mixing on his face. So, ha, you're in the wrong end of the world then, boy. But let me save you the voyage. Thule was destroyed long before you were born. That can't be true. Jim's mind reeled with the implications. If Thule was already destroyed, then all this death and suffering, all this way they'd come, was for nothing. All those fairies. Nix's friend. Sacrificed for knowledge that was already lost. Believe what you like. I sought it myself for many years. Found myself an old scand who told me firsthand of the raidings, the fire, the blood. He could have been lying, though. Jim said, his mind clutching at hope. Lying to protect the secret. She, and no, I think not. She was a child when it fell. Had to starve her for days just to squeeze that much from her. So you know where it is? I know it's in the north, far north, old scanned homelands. She was too young to know much more. The secrets of its exact whereabouts is long since lost to man. No, the godsmen, they have a map. Jim said, energised by finally having some new information to barter. They are heading there now, to destroy it once and for all. You can help us. Node's attention appeared to slip from the here and now, and his words seemed to come from deep memory. Every generation has them, you know. Always has. Folks who get so scared of the world around them that they abandon reason for the comfort of madness. Start changing the facts to fit their warped sense of the world. Then their hate makes their fears come true. He shrugged off his melancholy. But they are too late. Others got there first. There was nothing there for them to find but ashes. There was more he wasn't saying. Jim felt sure of it. Outright flattery might not work, but this cynical old mage could still boast. He had pride. So, you never went there? You just gave up? Node's eyes blazed, but his voice remained cold. I'm searching for a greater prize than a handful of seeds and some scraps of old code, boy. Like the satellite? The satellite is merely a gift for the one who can point me to what I seek. So there's someone even more powerful than you? Node bristled at that. Someone? No, something. Why do you think we're headed for the Steel Sea, boy? Headed? We're not headed anywhere. We're on... He trailed off as the pieces started to fit together in his mind. The map. The false cliffs, the tide that never seemed to come in, the satellite that just happened to strike land when there was open water for leagues all about them. Yes, you can feel it now, can't you? Node grinned, madness in his eyes as he stared up at the vaulting steel above his head. The ancients built them, the wealthy who desired to be free of the poor and the unworthy, island homes, seasteads. They proved most useful when the climate broke. We're already twenty clicks southwest of where I found you. He cackled, delighting in his revelation. Jim looked at the hunched old man with new eyes. This was not just another mad old hermit clinging to a rock. This was Node, greatest of the Tecromancers, and this whole island was his vessel, carrying him across the seas. Where? Where are we going? Jim asked, fearing the answer. To visit an old friend, Node smiled. He flexed his metal arm, looking past Jim toward the stair. And you should never visit unannounced without a gift.
Jim heard a ringing on the metal stairs behind him as a group of the grey golems marched up and into the room, dragging a bundle between them. Jim half feared to see the captain, or Binks, tumble to the floor as they spread the bundle open, but it was just a collection of harvested tech from the satellite. Node waved them aside and crouched greedily over the pile of green tech plate, metal coils and bundles of wire. He rooted through the intricate plates, tossing scraps aside like a man might toss bones from his plate at a feast and growing more frantic by the moment. No! 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 He hurled one of the boards at the nearest golem, the sharp tech plate gouging it cruelly on its exposed gut, but of course the creature did not flinch. Node surged to his feet again, raging at the grey automatons. Override all! Go back! Bring every piece from the wreck to me now! Wordlessly, the four golems turned to obey. Node kicked at a scrap of offending tech, sending it skittering across the floor to crash into an ornate copper wall. He massaged the shoulder of his metal arm, deep in thought. Some idea seemed to occur to the mage then, and he pointed a metal finger at the rearmost golem, now at the top of the stair, calling, You! Stay! The golem froze, then turned vacantly to guard the exit. Node's attention slid back toward Jim. I've misjudged you, boy, he said, his voice dripping with threat. You are perhaps more intelligent than I had guessed. Do you know what a transceiver does? Mm. He strode back toward Jim, who hesitated. He'd never heard the word, but... Speak! demanded Node. No, Jim stammered. I don't know what that... A transceiver is a key, interrupted the mage. It allows two pieces of tech to weave the trace to transmit and to receive data through the air. Jim tried to swallow, but found his mouth dry. He was suddenly very aware of the small sailcloth sack tied about his waist and the sharp corners of the tixerix within pressing against the back of his thighs. Such things are rare. Valuable, but a transceiver from a satellite, a transceiver from the heavens. I have burned cities for lesser things. What do you think I might do to a child? Jim fought for resolve. Would you help us if I told you where it was? Node sprang forward then, his metal hand clamping about Jim's throat, his wild eyes barely an inch away, studying. You resonate! There is no bargain here! I'll tear the island apart! I'll turn you and your friends into my servants, and you will find it for me! He froze then, his nostrils flaring as something tore his attention momentarily away from Jim. He sniffed the red light behind his left eye pulsing. Jim fought with every fibre of his being to stay still, to stay calm, but a barely perceptible flicker of his good eye betrayed him. It might otherwise have gone unnoticed, but Node was too close to miss it. He drew back, seeming to scan Jim with the red light of his eye. Surely not! The red eye blazed, and Node dropped to his knees, groping at Jim's waist, tearing the sack free and gently removing the tixerix with trembling hands. He held it aloft, laughing and capering like a child who had received a long-desired gift. At last! At last! The thing it desires most! Waving his metal hand over the tech plate, the mage conjured some spell, causing the board to flicker into life and setting the small pinprick lights across its surface blinking. Instantly, the golem guarding the stair surged forward, grasping arms outstretched, the light in its eye gleaming, but Node threw up a hand to halt it. Not this piece! I already have this piece! Clutching the Tixerix greedily to his chest, he strode to an intricate steel panel among the copper reliefs on the wall. 
He waved his metal hand once more over the panel, causing clasps and rods to twist and writhe away. The steel panel seemed to open like flowering petals, revealing a dark cavity within. Still jabbering, Node placed the transceiver inside, as gently as a mother might place a newborn babe into its cot. The petals closed once more, sealing the precious tech away. You have it now! Jim called over Node's mad ravings. You've no more use for us! The old mage smiled hawkishly then, moving to another workbench. If there is anything to be learned from the mistakes of the ancients, it is waste. They waste it so much. Cast things aside the moment they were old or imperfect. We can't afford to do that now, can we? I'm sorry, my talents are not without their limitations. You really are quite clever, but none of that will carry over once I'm done. But, yes, I'll still find a use for you and your friends, even without your mind. The journey back to the cells was a blur. A stocky golem returning from the harvest was summoned to seize him and to guard the cells thereafter. The blood had seemed to drain from Jim's head, which swam in a rising tide of panic as he was dragged up the winding stair once more. He'd doomed his friends. They seemed to know it, too. He heard the sobbing before he even reached his cell. Gam had unbound his ears and tied the great thick bandage around Nix's skull, who still shivered in a state of shock. Gam, his wide, spliced ears now unprotected, winced at the sound of Duke's sobbing cries. Jim looked helplessly at them as he was thrown into the cell opposite with Scup. The older boy climbed down from the narrow window and looked at him with lines of fear etched on his face. I'm sorry, Jim. He shook his head gently. It's the Archon. She's left. Our voyage through the world of the Risen Tide continues in the next chapter, which will be here on YouTube in just a few days. New chapters will be uploaded on Monday and Thursday every week. Hit subscribe to stay up to date. Or, if you just can't wait, the full tale is available today on Audible, Spotify and more. Thanks for listening.